welcome uh, to everyone and thank you so much for joining us to this uh, very special uh, webinar today uh, with uh, the distinguished um, Professor Khaled Abul Fadl, uh, who will be uh, here with us today to talk about his most recent book, uh, The Prophet's Pulpit, uh, Commentaries on the State of Islam, uh, that is edited by uh, Dr. Joseph Linhoff. Uh, we're very grateful and very humbled indeed to have him uh, with us today. Uh, before I begin uh, introducing our, um, our special speaker, I wanted to just do some housekeeping issues to uh, let you know uh, about this webinar today. Uh, we will um, begin by introducing Professor Abul Fadl, and then he will uh, so graciously and kindly speak for about 10 minutes to give us sort of a quick run through of, of the book. And then uh, we will have a Q&A, our discussion in which I will ask um, Professor Abul Fadl a couple of questions. And our attendees will have the opportunity to ask him questions as well. So we have a Q&A chat box. You're welcome to drop your question in there. Uh, I can't promise that we will uh, get to all these questions, but I, uh, I do hope to uh, get to as much of them as possible. Uh, this webinar will, uh, inshallah, last about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes tops. Um, so we thank you for taking time out of your day or evening, depending on uh, where you're joining from, to uh, be with us today. We hope it will be um, a fruitful and beneficial um, you know, time for all of us. So, um, and before that, I'd just like to take a moment to express my profuse thanks to uh, Grace Song, the executive director of the Usuli Institute for uh, facilitating um, uh, our communication with Professor Abul Fadl and uh, making sure um, that things run smoothly today. And um, just for everything that uh, she does, um, and it's just uh, such an honor uh, to, to have Professor with us today. And I thank you, Grace. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Noura Khaled, um, my colleague who uh, set up uh, this webinar for us today and all the registration, everything that um, is you know, uh, tied to uh, Zoom logistics. So without further ado, um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm uh, Farah Sharif. I am the Associate Director of the uh, Islamic Studies Program at Stanford University. We are the Central Forum for the Study of Islam and Muslims on the Stanford campus. And um, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you all for uh, joining us again. And without further ado, I will now proceed to introduce our speaker today. So even though you know he needs no introduction. Um, Professor Khalid Abul Fadl is one of the world's leading authorities on um, Sharia, Islamic law, and Islam. He's a prominent scholar in the field of human rights, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, political asylum, refugee law, the trafficking of human beings, um, and law and policy. Uh, he is currently the Omar and Esmeralda Alfi Distinguished Professor of Law at the UCLA Law School. And he uh, is the founder of the Institute for of Advanced Usuli Studies, the Usuli Institute, which is a nonprofit educational institute dedicated to the study of ethics, beauty, and critical thinking in the Islamic intellectual tradition. Uh, in 2020, uh, Dr. Abul Fadl received the American Academy of Religion Mar uh, Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. Um, he also received the University of Oslo Human Rights Award. Uh, his latest book, which we'll, we, we will be discussing today, The Prophet's Pulpit, Commentaries on the State of Islam, comes after uh, a very sort of uh, prolific uh, long line of um, wonderful and very successful books, including Reasoning with God, uh, Reclaiming Sharia in the Modern Age, uh, The Great Theft, Wrestling Islam from the Extremists, Speaking in God's Name, Islamic Law, Authority and, uh, and Women, Rebellion and Violence in Islamic Law, and so on and so forth. So uh, with, without further ado, I will um, now turn it over to uh, Professor Abul Fadl and uh, uh, ask him to speak 
for about 10 minutes about um, his latest book. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Abulfad. Thank you, Farah, and uh, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I'm very grateful to you and to the uh, program uh, for inviting me. Um, you know, first, uh, to uh, give credit where it's due, I'm very um, grateful to uh, uh, Grace um, Song, my wife, and um, to um, Joseph Linhoff, uh, the editor uh, for this book, because the, the idea of this book was really theirs. And um, uh, uh, Joseph Linhoff is a brilliant uh, young uh, Islamic studies scholar um, who um, played a key role in, in the birth of this book. Um, so, uh, the, the book makes uh, a series of interventions on uh, short, succinct interventions. They originated as um, Friday sermons um, and then transformed into short, succinct, poignant essays on um, a whole series of issues um, uh, that um, is present and um, that, that are present and pressing, um, I think for um, Muslims generally, but Muslims in the West in particular, uh, and even more specifically, maybe Muslims in the United States. Uh, but the, the response has been interestingly enough worldwide. I mean, I've, I've received a lot of correspondence um, from Muslims in Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, uh, um, um, Morocco, Asia. I mean, so uh, it, the, the book has, seems to have ha had a wider appeal. Uh, Muslims in India have been um, another um, large block of people. And what I think is, is very interesting, uh, one is that um, now in a, in a, a lifetime of involvement with Islamic studies and a lifetime of involvement with Muslim communities, um, it, I think it's very interesting that these interventions, um, I was forced to give these sermons um, outside the context of Muslim institutions in the United States. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very interesting um, issue and maybe issue that is worth talking a bit more about and exploring uh, if people are interested. Um, considering how pressing and relevant and considering the response of uh, Muslims to the, whether the, the sermons that were um, posted on the net or eventually the, even the response of Muslims to this book, um, it, these interventions should have taken place in institutional Muslim spaces. Um, but I found it very difficult to do that. And I found, uh, Muslim spaces in the West um, uh, closed. Um, the other thing, the, the other major point that I'll, I'll make is that um, sermons and especially the Friday sermon, khutbat uh, al-Jum'ah and the, the role of khutbat al-Jum'ah uh, it is extremely rich in Islamic history and extremely layered. Uh, and um, in many ways, the state has always had, whatever state we're talking about, has always had a keen interest uh, in that space, that space of what is spoken in a mosque on every Friday. 
but at the same time, um, it, it it has been the space where the great amount of um, cultural richness and pluralism has manifested itself in Islamic history. Uh, so it, yes, you know, especially in pre-modern times, uh, the, the state was has often tried to control the space. Um, the space has always been a contested political slash religious um, slash cultural space. Um, and depending on what, on a, on a, on a you know, often historical period, um, location, uh, urban area, rural area, uh, whether the state has been able to monopolize that space. Um, but the politics of the prophet's pulpit in the modern age, I think are uh, fascinating. And uh, in light of the type of interventions that uh, I've made that were memorialized in this book, uh, effectively um, turning these, these what originated the sermons into, a, into short essays, um, I think it's it's a uh, it, it's um, it speaks volumes and it says a lot about the modern Muslim condition and the and in um, uh, the role of religious speech uh, in um, and the way that religious speech intersects with uh, authority, power, uh, culture. Um, issues of social empowerment, censorship, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's. Um, I'll close with this because I want to keep my, my comments short to, to entertain as many questions as possible. Um, that um, uh, I noticed for instance, that there's a book coming out by Yale University Press. I, I noticed that after the Prophet's Pulpit was published, I think it's a collection of sermons by uh, female imams. Um, I, I, I've just noticed the advertisement. I mean, obviously I, I haven't seen the book. Um, and um, I would speculate that the reason that Yale uh, University Press is publishing this book is, is because of an awareness of um, that often the, the Friday sermon is the front line where all types of complex sociological, religious and political issues are negotiated. Um, and in, in many ways, um, uh, this is in the, in the same realm. Um, these interventions, uh, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're quite intentional and considering the, the, the response that I've received so far, um, especially from Muslims, um, it's a testament to the, to the relevance, at least, of these interventions, whether one agrees with them or not. Um, so th that's why I'm, I'm particularly happy that Farah extended this space to talk about this book. Um, uh, and I hope it, it, um, the conversation proves to be fruitful. Thank you, Farah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abul Fadl. Um, so indeed, you um, pointed to the uh, way in which uh, the sermon uh, has symbolic significance in Islamic history. Um, it is a powerful oratory tool that, um, you know, it, it is not um, something that is um, sort of minor of minor importance. I can think of, for example, uh, the khutbah, the sermon of uh, Sayyida Zainab at the court of uh, Yazid which to me is one of the most powerful protests in history, let alone in Islamic history. Um, and there's also this issue of from orality to textuality. So, which is, um, as we all know, um, sort of the classic um, mode of transmission 
from the earliest days of uh, Islam and Islamic knowledge production. So can you comment a little bit more on sort of this turn from the oral to the textual and, um, and what it means when um, state repression can sort of change the course of an entire uh, tradition of, of speaking out and having uh, a pulpit and having uh, agency and having a voice. Uh, when, when that voice is gone, what happens to a civilization? Yeah, I mean, it, it's so, there's so many fascinating issues um, about this. So we know um, the space for the Friday sermon um, to the extent we can, we, we, we can um, investigate history and find out what the, how that space were, was occupied in the earliest uh, years of Islam. I mean, we, we are, obviously we have uh, in texts at least some sermons that were preserved and and by the nature of things whether they're historically preserved as is or they reflect a a creative memory of what was done i mean that that's beside the point but the you know the, the space for the sermon was always eloquence um and the tension between you know the eloquence that produces doctrine that is significant for law and theology, but at the same time, um, accessibility to the, to the common person. And we also know that from you know, the, 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 the days that the Umayyads uh, would uh, dictate the cursing of Ali or uh, other members of Ali al-Bayt, um, in their Friday sermons to the attempts of the, the early Abbasid uh, empire to regulate uh, sermons uh, to the, the largely complicated and uh, I mean, the Islamic history is full of narratives of uh, jurists that are persecuted because they don't say the right thing in the Friday sermon or they negotiate the Friday sermons in ways that clashed with various powers. Uh, and then we know that we come to the modern age and having those of us who grew up um, in the, I suspect, I mean, any Middle Eastern country, I suspect, but um, country like Egypt or Kuwait where, where I grew up, uh, where the state, it, it is taken as a, a basic tenet that the state cannot afford to allow um, that space to be articulated out of the control of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point that, you know, periods in, this, in Egyptian history, like right now in Egyptian history, where the state literally writes the sermon and simply has the imam um, literally either mem from memory or just read the sermon that the state has written. And, um, and then well, what is really interesting is that it, it, this rather suffocating dynamic where, where, the, where the state controls religious space um, so vehemently uh, you, for so many Muslims that as, attempted to escape that authoritarian dynamic by uh, going to the West. And where they, in theory, can articulate religious speech in relative freedom and have the autonomy to negotiate that space without the fear of an uh, overbearing and, uh, state. But yet, what I find fascinating is that uh, the pulpit among Muslims in the West turned out to be significantly self-censored. Mm. So self-censored that 
any participant among Muslim communities in the United States, for, for instance, knows of a series of taboo topics. Uh, taboo topics that if you speak about, the likelihood is that you will become a pariah in um, institutional circles. Uh, you will not be able to give a sermon um, in formal institutional um, uh, in formal institutions in in the in among Muslims in the West, and this dynamic of self censorship and how it comes about and why it's perpetuated and what topics it chooses to um, pretend that they either don't exist or to communicate that these are the two taboo topics. And part of the purpose of this volume was to directly and indirectly um, poke at that, to, to be quite honest, uh, to, to deal with topics that I knew uh, would uh, be topics that are not welcome in uh, formal Muslim spaces. I think the, 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 the politics and the history of the, 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 the prophet's pulpit, as I call it, um, it's endlessly fascinating. And it, it tells us a lot about the Muslim condition. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in, in the present historical moment, uh, what, what happens when uh, the prophet's pulpit becomes highly censored? Um, I guess it is it what happens in any society when there is, uh, when, um, there's lack of transparency and there is an insistence on uh, only dealing with what is imagined to be entirely safe in public spaces. Right. Um, the thing about safety is that yes, it's it can give you a lot of stability, but it is also remarkably boring. Um, and um, it conducive to apathy. And um, so as I think a lot of Muslims would, my experience with the Friday sermon is that I absolutely dreaded the Friday sermon is that I, I, would, I would dread the boredom. Um, you know, 30 years of attending Friday sermons in the United States I think my general experience is that I'm bored out of my skull. And, and part of when it came time to, for me to accept the challenge of giving a Friday sermon, I, I, I tried to challenge it, the boredom element, and to say something that's relevant. Uh, but it's very interesting how um, when you do become relevant and you do wake up people in the Friday sermon, uh, there are people that institutionally, it seems to create a great deal of anxiety um, mm -hmm. and a great deal of displeasure uh, by a, a population, largely an immigrant population that doesn't know how to be safe. Um, the imagined safety in, um, In, 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 in perhaps um, highly impressionistic, but artificial ways. Um, anyway, there's much more we can say about that. Yeah, no, actually when I read, when I read the book, I said an alternative title could, could be the khutbas we all wish we were listening to uh, in our local <laughs> mosque. So it's not, these are not your average uh, khutbas. And I do recommend that uh, people uh, have the book, get the book uh, if, if they don't, if they haven't yet, because I feel like it, it at least has the power to um, rouse one from a, from this state of like stasis and sort of this frozen um, um, sort of approach to sort of this underwhelming, uh, very irrelevant to our, our everyday realities type of khutbah. So um, it, it's a it's a good step in, in in a good direction, and we need we need more of that rhetoric, whether it's in in your living room, whether it's on the internet, whether it's in the form of a book, because uh, you never know uh, how how that might might ripple. So I I would like us now to go sort of uh, zoom out um, 
pun intended, I guess, to, to talk a little bit about sort of the, the larger framework of, of, of Professor Abul Fadl and his um, sort of intellectual corpus. Um, and I would like to start by asking uh, about Sharia. So here in the West, the word Sharia elicits this visceral reaction as if it's, I think you call it a boogeyman in your yeah. book. Um, and you've also at the same time painted how Sharia among modern Muslims or in, in, in Muslim states uh, is also uh, sort of this uh, sensitive topic um, and um, that it sort of elicits fear and uh, sort of these accusations of, of uh, extremism tied to this word. Um, and then you also have the angle of Muslims themselves not understanding Sharia, uh, misapplying it, uh, approaching it as if it's a, you know, be all end all, uh, you know, a black and white kind of worldview. So what after all your years of, of research and all your years of being a classically trained jurist and an Islamic law specialist, what is it that mm. most people get wrong about Sharia? Well, I mean, it, it's uh, so much of so much of Muslim culture, um, and I, I use culture here in in, in 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 a broad in the broad sense of of uh, the the lived experience of Muslims at at, at so many. So many of the the symbolisms of identity in the Muslim heritage um, have become so unstable in the modern age and have sort of been tossed up for renegotiations. But often, um, Muslims don't have the the type of political um, autonomy to renegotiate their own culture independent from the colonial experience and the post-colonial experience. And, and so when we come to the concept of Sharia, on the one hand, Sharia is a technical legal system, the, the, the corpus of inherited Sharia that is preserved in all these legal texts, it, it displays so many of the characteristics and attributes of legal thinking, the way lawyers think. And so much of it in terms of the inherited tradition can only be understood from the perspective of legal sociology how lawyers talk about concepts, ideas, process, procedures, hypotheticals, and, and why. That law in its essence is a form of linguistic practice. Law is a, a discipline, an art by which a technical art where, where a sociological group that communicates with one another in, in uh, this um, symbolic language that is so dependent on, and what we find in legal sociology is that lawyers across traditions, across borders, across historical periods have common characteristics in the way that they analyze things and think about things. Now, this historical technical Sharia, the, 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 the product of the legal mind is coexists with a Sharia as the path to divinity, which has a lot of moral import, ethical import that, um, is often confused and mixed with the technical structural Sharia. So the, 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 the tension to put it very bluntly and very simply is that if you are dealing with Sharia as a, an inherited legal system with all its procedural rules, with all its precedents, with all its, um, 
it then it is yes it is it's very unyieldy it's um it, it, to import it upon and what has become a, a sociological reality that is uh, that that is very separate or very different than the sociological reality that produced this structural technical sharia you are going to get you're going to get into points of tension and serious gaps right away. But Sharia as a, a normative ethical system about how to integrate divinity into human life. What does, what is the role of the divine? Uh, what role precisely does God play in human life? Um, uh, it, that's a, a, a a separate matter, a normative matter. And so, again, to if someone comes and, and, and says, Sharia for me is the application of the Hadood, and to figure out how we can flog someone for committing fornication, or it, 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 it doesn't surprise me that be, because the means of punishment are medieval means, they're pre modern means. Uh, there means that are foreign to the modern consciousness of the average human being. Um, it, you know, the way that culture has been formulated in, in our modern age. Uh, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that it would elicit such a panicked response in so many circles. It doesn't surprise me that people say, uh, the historical technical Sharia is unyieldy. Uh, we can't apply it because we can't bend back the, the arms of history. But the the part of Sharia that cannot be tossed out is, to put it just bluntly, uh, the path to goodness and especially goodness with the divine in the center of that goodness. I mean, it is, it's one thing to speak about goodness and moral values and exclude God. But in essence, if we forget about the, the technocratic Sharia, the Sharia as a, as a technical legalistic practice and focus on Sharia as the core values that negotiate the role of divinity in human life, then we are talking about Islamic morals and Islamic ethics. And that I would, I'm hard, I would be hard pressed to imagine an Islam without that. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to have an Islam that doesn't have anything to say about justice or an Islam that doesn't have anything to say about racism or um, economic deprivation or um, the role of orphans in society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that sense of Sharia is what is often tossed out because we are burdened by the historical, technical, technocratic legacy of Sharia. Mm -hmm. And that was the major purpose of reasoning with God is to walk through, you know, to basically take readers on a journey um, through all the, the, the back and forth about, um, uh, you know, for me, if you say Sharia has no role, then how do we sp speak about uh, a role for the divine in Islamic spaces? Unless you want to have an Islam without the divine, um, um, like for instance, um, Shahab Ahmad's book, um, What is Islam? I mean, it, it effectively, Islam becomes just a sociological reality. Um, constructed through a thoroughly temporal experience that gives up 
that simply gives up on the idea of the divine. Uh, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate, uh, it, it, um, it, 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 it's sort of the, the, the um, I'm missing the, the where it's not caving in, but the, where you, you the uh, ultimate accommodation of secularism. Hmm. in speaking and about the historical experience of Islam and saying, well, you know, we, we just human beings, we give up on the idea of divine, but to what extent then do, do you have a religion? Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, um, I think the, the problem though, is that it takes, and I'll, I'll stop with this, but it, it takes a great deal of legal training. The, the reason we think of lawyers, uh, of a, that some lawyers are brilliant, is that they can work within the technicalities of law, the artificiality of le the legal linguistic practice, and develop the artistic ability to get results despite the all the numerous encumbrances of legal linguistic practices. But it is a disastrous, a absolute disaster when people who are either not lawyers at all or incompetent lawyers uh, negotiate that linguistic practice and uh, try to get results uh, because it's, um, you know, like any, like any trade. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you could end up with absolutely results that are produce a great deal of social trauma and a great deal of ethical trauma and moral trauma. Um, and that's, I think, the predicament of modern Sharia. Uh, it's uh, uh, you know between the technical law and the and the and the moral norms. Um, is, is a gap that is constantly being negotiated. Uh, and I, I, Muslims have just been overwhelmed with so many challenges uh, since colonialism that uh, things have not really gone smoothly. Right. I mean, and, and another, I feel, central edict to, to your work and to your vision of Islamic law and this very sort of um, fine-tuned critique from all sides. It, it's very hard to 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 hold this liminal space of being able to critique Sharia today, but also be an active participant in it, to adjudicate in it. Um, it is a very difficult process indeed, um, and you know, it, nobody's nobody's perfect. It, it's it's an Im, you know imperfect world, but um, uh, we we all need to have that kind of nuance uh, when we talk talk about Sharia and um, I guess is to give ourselves grace uh, and, and and just mercy when when we when we are doing it so you know for part of the the prophet's pulpit is that I wanted to demonstrate um, that the the Sharia as a normative inspiration, for at least my ishtihad as to how to incorporate the divine in our moral thinking, in, from my perspective, in our Sharia thinking, how we can talk about issues relevant to Muslims in the modern age, in the modern moment, without getting bogged down by the encumbrances mm -hmm. of technical, the technical historical legacy, the, 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 the technical sharia, um, to, to, uh, to at least try to demonstrate uh, how sharia can be present, relevant, and real. Um, because uh, one of the things that is very frustrating about modern Muslim Sharia discourses is uh, it, it's, it often sounds like superimposing 
the language, the technical language that existed in one age upon another in highly artificial ways that just seem um, unreal. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, and produce results that are very odd to the modern conscience. To, to the way that the consciousness is constructed in the modern age. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether I'm successful in it or not is, is another matter, but to, to speak to speak in a, in a straightforward manner about what is relevant and what is important and to uh, try to demonstrate how God can God can interact in human space without squeezing out the humanity mm. in that space because that that's often what um, uh, you know the modern the modern predicament is is that when when we try to incorporate God into our into our spaces uh, we often treat God as if this the space, cancels the human element and ejects humanity once divinity comes in. Uh, and then we all become sort of like robots speaking for the divine. Um, I, I think that's just a very bastardized and a very vulgar notion of religiosity. And it, it you know, I understand why it exists. Um, uh, because it's often a defensive mechanism against perceived secularism and so on, but uh, but it it um, I think it impoverishes the role of religion and um, the and you know it's it's a vulgarization of the role of religion in in our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, your your. Um style of scholarship is is very very powerful to the reader you know they, they're going to see from the first page or two or even hearing you speak now that you have no holds barred when it comes to calling out uh you know um things you deem unjust or morally compromised or you, that don't live up to the highest principles of of islam and universal values of of goodness, uh, virtue, um, beauty, and justice, and so on. And so of, obviously that's uh, garnered you uh, a little bit of uh, sort of controversy, maybe pushback. You've earned yourself uh, a lot of detractors over the years. You've been called a liberal by some, a progressive by some, a, a martesili. Uh, most recently, I, I've seen that you've been dubbed uh, a Quranist. Um, which to me, you know, you're, you're doing something right if you're annoying all these people from all these camps. But um, can you, you know, comment, what do you make of, of this, of this uh, sort of this pushback, uh, these labels, these polemics uh, on you or on your work? I mean, it is, um, you know, we often label people when, when, we want to give ourselves an excuse not to invest time in in carefully listening to what they they're saying uh, because th that's really when labeling is is a, is a mech is a mechanism to let off uh, let us off the hook uh, so if i want to you know uh, not deal with someone's thought and so I can label them conservative and then pretend like I know what their thought is about. It's just conservative. And so it's a shorthand of saying, let's ignore, let's ignore this. And that's precisely what my, um, you know, there are some people who um, uh, you know, maybe genuinely disagree with me about the role of the Emirat, for instance, or um, the authoritarianism of MBS in Saudi Arabia, or the, author the, the, the abysmal human rights record of CC in Egypt. Maybe there are some people who sincerely disagree with me and think that these people are doing good things. And then, then, um, 
then they're paying attention, but the problem is in their soul and in their intellect and their heart that they, they're not troubled by injustice and, and by human suffering and, and so on. But the, what you're referring to is that this, you know, I, I don't want to invest the time to actually listen to the, the, your discourse, the, the, the particulars of your discourse. So I just label you and I move on. And what I find about uh, very interesting about because also add to these labels there have been times where I've been called Shiai, um, you know all labels grab a little morsel or a little part of something you uttered so some reality of what you are and generalize it into a um, you know into a, 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 a generalize it into just this a, a label that that supposed to cover you the irony is that you know in part I'm everything uh, because my I, I read everything and everything has ex, you know persuades me to some extent and doesn't persuade me to another extent so you know the irony is that I, I am in part Salafi, I'm in part Mu'tazili, I'm in part Ashari, I'm in part Mataridi, I am in part Sufi, I am in part Shia, I am in part. So, uh, and the, uh, there are persuasive elements. Even the Khawarij had persuasive elements. I mean the Khawarij. Uh, believed in women leading prayer, which is a position that I find uh, convincing under so, uh, rejected stoning as a punishment for zina, uh, which I find their position and uh, their argument has a lot of merits about the difference between Israelite law and Quranic law and so on and so forth. So um, what what it all boils down to, in in my opinion, and the, you know, when I when I'm talking about being excluded from a lot of institutional Muslim spaces, is that um, my understanding of what the example of the Prophet was about was that this is a man that appealed to the powerless that this was a man that represented a, a, a movement against corruption of power, against injustice, against unethical behavior, uh, against the exploitation and mistreatment of human beings. And for me, following the moral of example of a great man is to understand what the moral objectives or what made this man protest. And there are those people who have turned Islam into, instead of a, a theology of protest against injustice and against oppression, They've turned Islam into um, something not about human uh, causes, but as if God needs our worship, or as if God, or it's primarily about providing God with what God needs, fasting and praying. And but you know, it's a very different Islam, an Islam that I frankly don't understand. For me, uh, if if Islam and in fact, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think that's the role of religion generally, in my view. If, the, the, if religion ceases to be God objecting to the injustices committed by human beings, then I no longer understand that God. That for me, God doesn't need our worship doesn't need our supplications, our fasting. It's not that we don't do it. It's just that we do it for our own good. We do it to give us courage to stand up against injustice. The reason we fast or we pray or whatever 
um, and I understand that now I'm talking Muslim theology, but you know, for for all the uh, the the scholars out there, you know, this is a case study. Consider it a case study in in Muslim discourse in Muslim discourses. Um, is to to give me the confidence to stand up for justice and to oppose injustice and to do it. Why? Because that's what I believe. God, the reason God gave us religion is to do that. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, then I, I, I see that as, and I think that is where, you know, a lot of the, 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 the tension occurs, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of the pigeonholing and attempt to label you occurs. Um, when, when um, it, it, it's people, it, it, you know, that try to figure out where you're coming from that don't believe right. that for you, God is about a stand against injustice are, are puzzled by you. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's from my perspective there. Well, that's, that's a perfect segue to a central question really that I had for you um, and, and for our audiences, I think, because you know you dedicate this book, it says this book is dedicated to Muslims around the world suffering under injustice and oppression. Um, justice is a central edict to, uh, to, to your work, to your worldview, and uh, arguably you say this is a central Islamic and Quranic and prophetic uh, edict that should be at the core of, 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 of yeah. the sort of the, the worldview or the approach of Islam altogether. So, and you in the book, so um, meticulously turn our attention to um, grave Islamophobic uh, sort of um, human rights violations, injustices wrought upon Muslims. You, you talk about sort of uh, the persecution of um, uh, Muslims in, in, in Jerusalem who are unable to, to pray in peace during uh, Ramadan and Eid uh, in Palestine. You talk about sort of the internment of, of the Uyghur communities um, and uh, the sort of the uh, ongoing now, I, 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 arguably we're reaching the pinnacle of the condition for Muslims in India uh, that is yeah. bordering on uh, genocide and ethnic cleansing. Um, so given all this, and, 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 and unfortunately, Muslim states, Muslim leaders and rulers are, 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 are muted. They, they, they are not taking any action. They are not coming to, to the solidarity or any kind of real show of, of sort of um, action on, on their end to support or even champion or even, even with thoughts and prayers. So given all of this and this sort of very bleak uh, time that we are living in um, and sort of this... Uh, you know, universal theme of Muslims being, um, you know, otherized and 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 uh, un under you know under oppression. Where is justice going to come from, in your view? What is your theory of change? You know, I I've uh, said this before, um, but I really. Um, in in some ways, Muslims are burdened by the remarkable successes of early Islam, because we when we often think of how much injustice and oppression there is, we we are we think in terms of you know ten years the the prophet is oppressed in Mecca, and then the next 10 years or so, um, he's incredibly victorious. And, um, and so in the Muslim mind, it, it, you know, people get very, uh, feel a great deal of despair when they don't see that justice is achievable in the short term. We can learn actually quite a bit from the religious experience of people who were oppressed for centuries, um, like for instance, the earliest Christians, um, and whose form of jihad was to sa sacrifice the self to support a cause, to, to willingly uh, suffer in order to support a cause. And I really think that in the current 
historical period, um, we are seeing with the rise of Islamophobia and the aggressive reassertion of, of modern forms of colonialism, of colonizing Muslim societies. Um, because the, the, after the, 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 the crumbling of the Soviet Union, uh, there arose in the West a very aggressive, um, I mean, it, it's pro-Christian or it imagines itself to be a, 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 an articulation of Judeo-Christian values or whatever, but that aggressively and, and very openly seeks to re-engineer Islam. And, and that's what we see with MBS and MBZ and CC and, you know, when, when, when someone like the, the president of a country like Egypt sits there and constantly talk, talks about tajdeed and fikr al-Islami, you know, renewing Islamic thought, and everything he says, it's clear that his audience is not his fellow Muslims, it's the West. Mm -hmm. when, when someone like MBS, it's obvious that he, he wants to convince the West that he's a good guy by re-engineering Islam, even re-engineering Mecca in, in along the lines that are um, consistent with Western market values, if you will. Um, same thing with uh, MBZ and, and, and the Emirat. The Emirat, the imagination that if you defend any Muslim cause, then you're backwards. If you stand up for Muslims in India, then that's backwards and reactionary. If you stand up for Muslims in China, that's backwards and re reactionary. If you stand up for Muslims in Palestine, that's backwards and reactionary. That is, it, it's, it, I remember when um, the, the Bush administration talked, this is the first Bush, not the second Bush, talked about the, the new world order and the new Middle East. And this is the time when, you know, you had, um, uh, um, and then later on, Condoleezza Rice, you know, running around in the Middle East and, and thinking of reorganizing the new Middle East uh, and Ashcroft and Condoleezza Rice and people like that talking about this is a new age for the Middle East. And what they were talking about is re-engineering Islam so that Islam stops being a, a problem. Um, and, and by that means that Islam stops objecting to um, the rights of, in, of its indigenous population that Islam basically says, no problem, go ahead, uh, take whatever you want, do whatever you want. We have nothing to you. We have no objections, no protests. Uh, we are basically vanilla. We're nothing, we're bland. Um, you can do whatever you want and we're with you as long as you continue allowing us to enjoy McDonald's or Burger King and you know whatever. And, um, so you end up in, 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 but what, if you believe in God, then you have to believe in hope for, for a Muslim, at least in that you have to say, well, uh, if there is suffering, then this is what, but I have to do my part. I, I have to testify for justice and for what, I believe is ethical. What my experience with the divine has instilled in me as to what the values of justice are and leave, you know, whether victory comes in my lifetime or comes three centuries down the line, the, the, a martyr testifies through their martyrhood. But it's, you don't testify through a criminal act by killing innocent people. That, that's that's facade for art, that's corrupting corruption on earth. That's not testifying. But when you willingly feed yourself and go and, and be fed to the lions, as the early Christians did, or you willingly testify and be persecuted and targeted and maligned and slandered and, and you you, your entire life is a testament to the principles that should be upheld. Um, 
and you leave the rest to to who owns this universe. I guess that's the difference between a believer and non-believer. That's ideally should be. A believer should always have hope because ultimately they believe it's in God's hand. And if God, uh, you know, hasn't made the decision to um, allow the condition of Muslims to improve, um, then that's God's business. But my business is to just testify. And I really just, because this often with Muslim students, especially so many graduate students, the sense of despair is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I say, you must find, you must learn to find joy in just testifying for what you believe is the truth, regardless of the consequences, mm -hmm. even if it means um, you're going to live a life of hardship, but to, to find validation in that role, right. the role of the martyr, um, the proper martyr. And, and that's how I look at it. I mean, and, and that's why, you know, all, all these criticisms, I, I fr frankly, I stay away from social media um, because I don't want my mind to be poisoned. I, I don't want to start holding a, a grudge against um, anyone. Um, so it's like, okay, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> Say I, whatever you want. Yeah, they should meet your ideas on, on their own terms um, and you know discuss exactly what you're saying rather than labels. And, and unfortunately, social media uh, is not uh, really no, yeah. a place to, a place for constructive uh, debate. So um, I guess we're nearing uh, the end of at least my portion of, of the webinar and my questions. But what you just said really is is helpful now to to talk a little bit about the Usuli Institute's ongoing project about the Quran and 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 undergoing a, a full um, tafsir, a commentary on the Quran, and perhaps you can shed a little bit light on that, especially as it pertains to how the Quran fits into all of this. It reminds me of prophetic narratives in the Quran where. They spoke up, you know. Uh, we have the prophet uh, Moses. He, he's, he's mentioned more, more, and uh, more than any other prophet in the Quran, and he himself stood up to Pharaoh. And you know, uh, say uh, Prophet Yusuf also garnered um, a lot of sort of, you know, you know, he went to, to prison and um, and and he he was, you know, it, the, the prophets weren't popular and uh, in their age in their time. So if if you know what you're saying is that. You, to, for you to witness, for you to speak up, it won't guarantee your popularity in, in this world. No. Um, and so what, what does the Quran teach us about, about justice? Well, how can the Quran give us the hope that we need? I mean, the, the, the whole pro, the, the, the project that I have now, I mean, it's, it's, we, we've covered 80 surahs. Um, you could, on the one hand, I, I have been very interested in the role of the surah in Islamic history, early Islamic history, and I've attempted to the best of my ability to, um, to, to comment on what I believe was the, 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 the earliest reactions to mm. the Quranic revelation in, in, in sort of the, the historical context of the revelation of each surah. So that on the one hand, the other hand is that in many ways, it, 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 uh, my approach to, to the Quran is to focus on the core ethical messages that because I believe that the entire revelation of the Quran it was not about just people who did not believe in God. Every prophetic narrative in the Quran is essentially about a, a prophet and a prophet unlike um, biblical prophets, Quranic prophets, or the same prophets, but the, the Quranic narrative is that they were men of each prophet was a man of high ethical character. And a, a 
a man or a human being of justice. And they go to people, it's not the people who are nice people and just people who happen not to worship God, but they actually go to people who are unjust or who are corrupt otherwise. And the, the, the constant, what the, 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 and this is what at least my Quranic commentary tries to emphasize um, is the, the constant, uh, um, the constant engagement with human e human egoism, egoism in the form of power, in the form of of oppression, in the form of when the pharaoh, for instance, says la orikum illa ma ara that I, the only thing you allowed to to the only way you're allowed to see things is the way I see things, mm -hmm. and the insistence that all of these people yet Allah Allah that they are trying to usurp the role of the divine why are they trying to usurp the role of the divine because according to the Quran God what God wants is the mizan what God wants is cost uh, God wants is justice and the balance and and fairness and all these people are basically usurping roles and usurping space that is not theirs. They're mm -hmm. overthrowing God. And consistently, the prophets come in and basically say, don't overthrow God, be humble, know your place, you know, stop treating people like garbage, like trash, etc." So in my view, the Quran is greatly impoverished by a reader who comes and misses, and this is what my commentary tries to do, is to show you the, the, the lines of argument exactly about the overthrowing God and overthrowing the divine and what that means in terms of core concepts like justice and fairness and equity and so on. Um, to, to make the Quran about God rather than human life, I think is a problem because it, it it's again, um, it, you know, it, it is if the Quran keeps telling us repeatedly that God benefits, God doesn't need our prayer, God doesn't need us, God doesn't, you know, God is self sufficient, um, and to turn the entire Quran into this basically. Um, uh, into a form of ritualistic engagement that has no moral implications or ethical implications. I think we strip the Quran of its normative power. And the reason that it has been such a powerful text in, throughout uh, human history. Um, it, the Quran, I mean, this is a lot of Emirati Islam or Saudi Islam or Egyptian Quran is basically the Quran without ethics. Read the Quran for blessings, you know, read the Quran so you get brownie points. It, 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 entire Islam is about the hereafter, but the here now, just leave it in the hands of the powerful and the corrupt. Don't bother us with about the here now. I, I, I yeah. Um, but I, I think your fate in the hereafter depends about it depends on what you do in the here now. If you fail to challenge, uh, if you fail to challenge corruption and inequity and unfairness and injustice, I don't think you're going to fare very well in the hereafter. And, and I think that's the basic point of departure between, um, you know, the way I approach the prophet's pulpit, pulpit as opposed to the way often people talk about religion as if, you know, as if it, 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 a technical point of ritual it will elevate God or not. I mean, it's, to me, it's silly. It just, you know. Yes, I think that's a, a perfect, um, perfect summary of sort of this entire the ethos um, of, of, the, of the book, of your previous books and your life's work. Um, thank you so much, yeah. uh, <laughs> Professor Abul Fadl, 
for, you, uh, for uh, enriching you. us. I think, let me just turn our attention now a little bit to the, the Q&A we've received from our uh, audience. Um, we, you did receive a lot of uh, questions uh, like Patawa as seeking help. I think, you know, it would be best for the them to, you know, consult their local um, scholars and perhaps- or if, can I just try to say, if, if you have, a, 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 because people do send me yeah. um, from around all legal questions, you okay. can just write me to my email at the law school. I mean, just look up okay. UCLA Law School and write, you, they can write, to my email. That's, that's very generous of you. So to those who are asked um, questions about their personal, you know, journey, uh, can 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 reach out to Professor Abul Fadl via his email, uh, which we can provide in the chat. Um, so I have this question here um, from Asha Ali, who asks, what does the Ummah mean when you are made to feel unwelcome as a Black Muslim? Even other oppressed Muslims do not see our humanity. As a Black Muslim woman, I fight and stand in solidarity with all the oppressed, especially Muslims, but I am constantly made to feel as if Islam does not belong to me and my struggles are not significant enough. Muslims lack a historical understanding of the position of Black Muslims since the advent of Islam. Not only do we have to fight against systematic racism, Islamophobia, as well as um, anti-Blackness from the Muslim community, we are left, left in uh, a limbo in the West, explicitly discriminated against in Arab countries. Um, further, it seems like khutbas in England are not ever about issues facing Black Muslims in African countries. So thank you, Asha, for, for your question. I'll give you know Professor Abul Fadl the chance to, to respond. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't... Um... Yeah, this is a big problem. Um, uh... Uh, the, the unfortunately, I mean, I remember um, the British historian, historian Arnold Toynbee, uh, who uh, in one of his essays says that, you know, the West has a disease if the, if we can infect, if Muslims are infected by, by the same disease, uh, uh, it will spell it does that, and, and he's talking about racism. Um, and he also talks about nationalism, that these are Western diseases that could uh, infect the Muslim mind. And, and I don't know, I mean, depending on how you read Ar Arnold Toynbee, whether he wanted the Muslim mind to be infected by it or not. But the co very concept of race and the, and, and the, the very idea of race, which is a, a human invention, um, thoroughly, completely. Uh, and unfortunately, Muslims, especially modern Muslims, especially colonized Muslims, um, quite frankly, one of the biggest problems is that colonized Muslims, which you experience in the form of immigrant Muslims, um, don't like their own race. And they very much, um, they want to pretend that there is no race in Islam, which means, unfortunately, is to ignore the reality of racism in, in modern human life, the pervasiveness of racism, and the extent to which racism has become a, serious uh, uh, pandemic in modern human life. You know, you in, whether you go in China, you encounter it. You go to Russia, you encounter it. And you encounter it in its most blatant, um, what can I say, vulgar colonial sense. Um, it, it has become a, a, con a, a contagion that has just spread throughout the way we treat Africa, the way we talk about Africa, that you know, from uh, uh, from being the, the 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 mother of humanity, the origins of all humanity, to even the the the, the way the, the value we put on African life. I mean, it's so blatant. If you're in, if you read studies on you know the, how. We react to human trafficking when it occurs in Eastern Europe, as opposed to when it occurs 
in Africa or human trafficking when it, it occurs even in Syrian refugee camps, which we actually don't have a very good reaction to. But whatever reaction we have, it is somewhat better than human trafficking when it takes uh, occurs in Africa. So what I'm saying is, is that this illness, this, this uh, serious moral illness, um, which I believe is Islam, it, it, it is, the, the, the core to the prophet's message was the rejection of racism and the rejection of racial uh, identity and the jahiliya of racial identity and, and racism. Um, but you are encountering migrant Muslims who unfortunately uh, in their post-colonial era are deeply racist. They've learned to be deeply racist They've learned to covet whiteness, to dream of becoming white, although they often don't recognize that, um, to effectively, although again, often this is not admitted, to want Islam to become a white religion, because in their mind, that's progress. If Islam becomes a white religion, then Islam becomes a part of the modern, advanced, world. Um, and that's shameful. I mean, that, there's no, no apologies for that. That's just shameful. And in my view, a, a complete uh, undermining of what Islam is. Um, uh, but it, 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 it needs honesty in discourse. I mean, I once I once was invited to an, an, a, a well-known Muslim academic institution, very well-known to, to all. And I, it, 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 I gave a talk about racism in, um, in modern Islamic theologies. And the students were very excited about the talk, but the students told me that their teachers in this Islamic institution prohibit them from discussing race and, and prohibit them from, uh, critical race studies is a bad word. And their teachers accuse anyone that talk about race as being a student of, of critical race studies. And after my lecture, uh, which again, the students reacted to really well, uh, this organization broke its promise to publish my lecture and they didn't publish it because I dare. And you know, this is exactly why I published a book like The, the, the Prophet's Pulpit, uh, is to, I speak about this repeatedly because I see this, we failed God as, as a person of religious conviction. I can't square racism with the divine. I just can't square it. The God who created every skin color. How do you, I mean, do you know how many Muslims will have a problem to marry their, their child to, to someone who's dark skinned? Um, how, how do you how do you make that jive with the Quran or the Prophet or Islam? I I, I it, it 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 completely puzzles the heck out of me. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um. I there are too many questions here for us to take them all. So I apologize to our audience. Um. And a lot of these answers you can find um, either on the Usuli social media accounts on the YouTube where. Uh, professor has addressed, uh, you know, a series of, of, of variations of these questions. So, for example, I have a question here. At what point historically did the practice of Islam get reduced to simply ritualistic aspects? Um, I have another similar question um, from um, Ekrem from Turkey, who asks, um, uh, is it uh, where, what went wrong and when is it mainly um, during the Umayyad time period that Sort of this this happened this manipulation of of Islamic principles to get reduced, um, and and so I think you know we can we can just sort of end end with that. If you would like to 
sort of take these thoughts, Professor Abul Fadl, and help us wrap up. Um, and so the, the main the main gist of the questions is really what went wrong, and the other questions are why and what can we do. So um, yeah. Well, you know, you know, there is, and and I think it, there is a, a very there's a Saudi scholar that um, that I have an enormous amount of respect for and who's unfortunately in prison now, uh, has been jailed for years in Saudi Arabia. And um, in fact, um, the charges against them, the Saudi Arabia is demanding death penalty. His name is Hassan Farhan al-Maliki, who um, writes, uh, one of the most gifted scholars I've read. Um, I mean, it's amazing that he, he's he's been in Saudi Arabia all his life, um, and he's you know, uh, and Hassan Farhan Maliki analyzes the the moral sort of the the, the conflict between Al Bayt and the the family of the Prophet and uh, Umayyad. The the um, in the very first century of Islam, uh, Umayyad power versus Al Bayt and the the moral um, struggle between the two. But so on the one hand, yeah, you, you you it's as if God is telling us power is always corrupting, and religion must always be the the must always testify for the disempowered that when religion becomes co-opted by the powerful and becomes the the instrument the the you know, the sword the gun of the powerful it, it becomes corrupted and the role of religion is not for the religious scholar and you know Islamic tradition is full of, uh, of um, a whole discourse about that. The idea of the religious, if a religious scholar gets too close to power, does that religious scholar lose moral, um, their moral status? And the Islamic tradition, this is a long discourse and the, the fascinating thing is that the majority said that yes, if you are a religious scholar and you get too close to power, then you are no longer of just moral character. And that ulama al salatin are a corruption. And ulama al salatin the, the, uh, the scholars who, who serve power and are wedded to power. Um, in my view, as, as if God is, is inviting us to reflect, as Hassan Farhan al Maliki does, to reflect and to ponder and to analyze the, what this conflict between Al Bayt and the ethics of Al Bayt versus Umayyad power, dynastic imperial power represented. And to that lesson then becomes relevant for historical periods and historical epochs uh, well into, um, you know, centuries later. And, and I think that part of what I resent about the colonial experience is that it denied every time any, there's any discourse about a Muslim anything, it is always understood in terms of what does it say about our relationship to the West? Or what does it say in terms of to our relationship to our to colonial powers? You know, it's if you talk about jihad, is it how does it affect these colonial powers? If you talk about Sharia, how does it affect colonial powers? If you talk about women's rights, uh, oh, you know, does it come from colonial powers? It does not come from, it's as if in the, in the same way that I can talk about American law, and I don't have to think about what the Russians think or what the Chinese think or what Muslims think. I could talk about American law in, in, in completely American terms mm -hmm. and argue left, right, up, down. And you know, it, all my concerns are 
what is relevant to American law or the common law system. But you don't have that in Islam. Right. You can't talk about anything in Islam without, it's always been in light of the probative eye of the West. It, does it make us look good vis-a-vis -vis the West? Does it make us look bad? Does this mean Islam is inferior? Does this mean the Islamophobes are right? Does this mean, how are the Islamophobes gonna weaponize this? And this is our greatest plight in modernity. Because if you can't talk honestly, then you can't reclaim your history and you can't reclaim your indep the independence of your narrative. A add to that the fact that the most influential historical narratives about Islam are those that comes from Orientalism, from Western scholars and Western institutions. Um, there, you know, a, a book published by Cambridge or, 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 or Oxford about Islamic history gets far more resonance than any book published in Turkey about Islamic history or published in Egypt. I mean, Egypt doesn't even count. It's not, it's not even on the, on the map anymore. Um, but it, 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 so Muslims are, you know, that really is, is, is an enormous part of the problem. Why am I saying this? Because yes, there was a corruption and a, a, a moral struggle between the Umayyads and Al-Bayt. But as long as the Islamic civilization existed well into the Ottoman period, you will always find a valuable moral discourse going on within the Islamic tradition. Mm -hmm. you, you know, whatever the going on in power, there is still Abu Hayyan al tawhidi you, you, you can still, Islamic civilization still gave birth to someone like Abu Hayyan al tawhidi a, a, a massive moral ethical mind. It still gave birth to someone like Ibn Aqil and his Kitab al-Funun. George Makdasi wrote a book about Ibn Aqil because his ethical thought is, is mind-blowing. It still gave birth to someone like Mullah Sadr or Shirazi. He, he, just his discourse on uh, Ayatul Nur in his uh, tafsir is mind blowing. It's it's an ethical masterpiece. Mm -hmm. So the Islamic civilization, even with the corruptions of power, continued to produce these polymaths of Ghazali, Ibn Miskaway. That had within their epistemological moment, not you, you look, understand them within their epistemological moment, their ethical philosophical interventions were resounding. Look at how Thomas Aquinas deals with Muslim thinkers. Look at how Maimonides has been shaped, crafted by Muslim thinkers. But there is a complete collapse after colonialism. And after colonialism made it a point to appoint who manages the holy sites. After colonialism made it a point that Jerusalem was no longer a part of the Muslim Ummah and controlled by Israel. And after colonialism decided that the Najdis, uh, these people from Najd take over the Hejaz and control the Hejaz and after colonialism decided that it appoints stooges who give favorable terms to Western companies as they exploit resources all over the Muslim world, whether the French, the British, the Dutch, et cetera, it has been a very grim picture. So decolonizing our narratives, Muslim narratives, challenge saying, let's, let's talk about Abu Hayyan al-Tawhidi without thinking about whether the, the, you know, how does, what implications this has about the West or not West, it is, is a, a, that's why I, I although George Buckley he was not Muslim, but I, I loved his scholarship because the man wrote, when he wrote books like Rise of Colleges in Islam or Rise of Humanism in Islam or his book about Ibn Aqib, he, was sort of a living example of, of a decolonized history. He, he, although again, not a Muslim, but he 
researched history, searching for answers without any regard to whether his Orientalist colleagues are going to like this or not. I, when I was at Princeton, I knew that uh, uh, George Magdusi was a persona non grata at Princeton, simply because uh, he you know, wrote a book like The Rise of Cultures in Islam. Mm -hmm. But um, it, that's the, the big, and I really wish countries, I mean, I'm, I'm just hoping, I really wish countries like Turkey, because Turkey had, you know, relatively more advanced, more modernized, more to take the lead again in, in the field of Muslim scholarship. I mean, at one time I was hoping it would be Indonesia, Malaysia, but, um, you know, um, these countries that have relatively more space to allow serious scholarship. I mean, isn't it confounding that Israeli scholars have greater influence on Islamic studies than Turkish scholars? Mm. I mean, it, it's, and it's not anything against Israeli scholars because many of them are very good, but it, it, it just speaks volumes about the role of power in and 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 power and privilege and colonial legacies in 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 how we construct narratives and understand Muslim history, understand Muslim theology, understand Muslim law, uh, understand Muslim everything. Um, yeah, it, it, it this is a, a far bigger topic. I just wish that Muslims would would um, would pay greater attention and emphasize honesty and transparency in discourse, you know, <clears throat> around the bush anymore. We need to have honest discussions about these issues and see where, the, you know, I know a lot of people think to refer to the Ummah is no longer a cool thing, but where, where if, it is incumbent that upon the Muslim Ummah to, to look within and to see where it has failed and what it can do to reinvent itself in light of these failures. Mm -hmm. Indeed, because uh, the condition of a people will never change if- uh, Until they change themselves, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think with that, uh, um, we're at half past the hour. We went a little over. I think we could easily go on uh, all day if we, we could, <laughs> but uh, we will, of course, respect your very busy schedule, Professor Abul Fadl, and uh, just allow me to thank you, uh, with my deepest gratitude to you for making the time for us today. Okay. Uh, the discussion was fantastic. Uh, um, we've we've uh, been thoroughly enriched um, and sort of uh, this message of, uh, this rousing message of sort of uh, you know, wherever we are, whether we're a scholar, a specialist, or uh, just uh, someone who's an onlooker or someone who's a seeker or curious, we can all learn so much uh, from you, Professor Khalid. And uh, we wish you continued, you know, success and, uh, and good health. And, uh, and, you know, we look forward to seeing more from the Osuli Institute and uh, we, we give our profuse thanks to um, Grace Song, the wonderful executive director, and your wife, who's uh, just a, a wonderful person uh, and, and scholar herself. Uh, and uh, just, uh, you know, bless you and your family. And thank you to all the guests who, uh, you know, tuned in from, it seems like, all over the world. And I do apologize again for not being able to um, go through all the questions, but I do advise all our listeners today to check out Usuli uh, Institute's website, to check out Professor Khalid's books, and you know, go ahead and buy the Prophet's pulpit, go and buy this book uh, and see what it's about for yourself. We, I hope we piqued your, your curiosity, we piqued your interests, because our discussion here only scratched the surface. Of, 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 of what is actually there. And uh, we hope you benefit from, much, from it as much as, as, as we have. So on behalf of the um, uh, Stanford uh, Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies, 
Um, uh, thank you again, Professor Khaled Abu Fadl, for joining us. Thank you to everybody who, who tuned in. Uh, please go on our website, sign up to our mailing list for more events like this, and also sign up to the mailing list of the Osuli Institute as well, of course. So thank, thank you. you thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Khaled. Take care. Thank you, everybody.